Hello, my name is Jess McIntosh. I'm from the Bristol Interaction Group, and uh, this work was done in collaboration with the uh, DFKI and Saarland University. So there are many techniques for hand tracking, and each technique is suited for, to certain applications due to their accuracy and form factor. Um, and EMG is particularly useful as a uh, mobile gesture recognition technique, um, but the practicality of this device is often ignored. So to quickly explain how EMG works, so muscle cells produce an electrical potential upon contraction of that muscle, uh, which results in a, in a signal like the one highlighted above. And this is measured using uh, electrodes, which are shown here on the bicep, along with a differential amplifier. Um, so the number of electrodes and the placement of these are important variables to both the accuracy and the ergonomics of a device. Um, however, currently existing wearables are worn around the wrist, uh, which are ergonomically acceptable to, to designers and users. So given this, we decided to find out whether EMG could still be used effectively at the wrist uh, so that it, it can be aligned with existing wearable device form factors as those shown in the previous slide. So to give you an overview of the talk, um, we want to give a particular emphasis on the notion of this kind of trade-off between accuracy and uh, ergonomics. Um, and I want to emphasize that also the results from the main study are more important because of potential future work and the implications of those results. So there's usually a trade-off between practicality and accuracy uh, for on-body tracking techniques. Uh, for example, um, there are some techniques which uh, look at the change in shape of the wrist, and this happens as a result of the tendons and muscles shifting as hand gestures are performed. And whilst they can be quite small and ergonomic, they're usually not the most accurate. Uh, optical techniques, on the other hand, are very accurate, but they may not be entirely suitable for a mobile wearable system due to practical issues such as occlusion, so you can't wear things like sleeves and whatnot. Uh, and sensor gloves are perhaps the most accurate solution, but you probably wouldn't want to wear this every day for long periods of time. Uh, EMG can vary significantly in, uh, in practicality and accuracy, depending on, the number, on, a, on a number of factors. Um, and in no particular order, this is uh, the number of electrodes. So the more you have, the better, but it becomes less ergonomic as you start covering your arm in electrodes. Um, secondly, the type of electrodes. So dry ones are more convenient, but the gelled ones perform better. And the signals are weaker at the wrist than at the forearm. Um, but the, of course, if it, it's key here that we try and restrict it to the wrist as this is conforming to existing socially wearable, uh, uh, acceptable placements of wearables. So typically EMG is used where the bulk of the muscle is and because of the stronger signal you get. So the trade-off that we had assumed from moving EMG to the wrist was that the wrist location would yield worse results. And also at the wrist, um, there is less surface area, so there are fewer places where you can place electrodes. And it's, it's also more difficult to differentiate between different muscles because they're so compact. Um, so we have this trade-off between ergonomics and accuracy. Um, and the variables are shown here, which contribute to each end of the spectrum. So our objective is to, is to try and find out what this trade-off in accuracy is with a focus on uh, changing these two variables so that it's on the wrist and it's ergonomic. So we performed a study with 12 participants to compare the wrist location versus the uh, upper mid forearm location, uh, classifying individual finger digit flexion movements. Um, and for this, we used two pairs of bipolar electrodes. Uh, these are the dry a variety with no foam, and this was worn on the anterior aspect of the forearm. And our results showed that actually the wrist location performed better than at the forearm location, and this surprised us because, of course, we had assumed that the trade off was that you would lose accuracy, um, but we had a thought about you know 
why, why, why is this the case? And um, the wrist shape changes a lot due to tendon movement at the wrist as the tendons are more superficial. And as explained earlier, there are devices which work on this principle. And there is not so much of this kind of change in musculature um, at the mid forearm location, so it's quite, quite specific to the wrist. Um, and after observing the signal in more detail, we found that the EMG signal was affected quite significantly by this kind of tendon movement. And we theorized that this was in fact the reason why uh, the EMG works better at the wrist. So we created a hypothesis which was that uh, the motion artifacts that arise from this tendon displacement in fact facilitates the classification of hand gestures at the wrist. In order to test this hypothesis, we created another experiment, uh, this time measuring the change in shape of wrist and removing the pressure modulation from the EMG signal. Uh, the idea is that we treat this modulated signal as a combination of two different signals. Uh, and by separating these signals, we can investigate the contributions of each sensor type. So, in order to separate the modulation from the EMG signal, we used uh, wet electrodes with uh, foam padding, which helped to remove the artifacts caused by pressure. And we used these uh, four sensitive resistors, uh, pressure sensors, uh, to uh, infer the change in shape of the wrist, as some devices do, um, and thus what would have caused the modulation of the EMG signal in the previous experiment. So in our main study, our experimental prototype had four pairs of EMG sensors, uh, which is an extension of two more from the previous one, and uh, four pressure sensors spaced evenly in between these EMG sensors. Our gesture set consisted of these 15 gestures, uh, consisting of both uh, wrist gestures and finger movements, and we categorized these into three different subsets. So our main study, again, had 12 different participants, uh, and each of those 15 gestures were performed 10 times each. And as the gesture was performed, the machine captures this data, and this is kind of what uh, the data kind of looks like. So we have uh, EMG on the top and pressure sensors on the bottom. Um, and from, the, from this signal, we extracted uh, several different uh, 1D time series uh, features, such as the RMS, the standard deviation, and the peak amplitude. And then using these features, we trained a, a machine learning classifier. So we used uh, an SVM with an RBF kernel, and we used the tenfold cross-validation technique in order to assess the accuracy of the classification. So here are our findings from the study. Uh, we've got accuracy on the left-hand axis and gesture sets on the bottom. And each line represents a particular configuration of sensors. So FSR here is the pressure sensors. It's a different name for it. Um, and to note firstly, uh, EMG is quite successful uh, when used by itself with an, accu uh, accu uh, uh, an average accuracy of above 86% for all gesture sets. And for finger gestures, uh, EMG outperforms the pressure sensing for uh, by about 5%. Um, and we saw the opposite for wrist gestures, um, with pressure sensors having an advantage of around 10% over um, EMG. And we used a two-way repeated measures ANOVA and found that statistically, these, uh, there is a significant complementarity between these two sensor types and for these two gesture sets. So that is to say that finger, that finger gestures can be classified better by EMG and that wrist gestures can be classified better by pressure sensors. And when they're used together, they are better than uh, when each technique is used alone. And this is particularly true for the case when we're classifying the entire gesture set. So this includes the, the finger gestures and the wrist gestures. So to summarize the results, um, we think that these findings support our initial hypothesis 
that the motion artifacts that arise from the tendon displacement does, in fact, facilitate the recognition of hand gestures, uh, but furthermore, in a complementary manner. So, in order to answer our initial question, uh, yes, EMG is still effective by itself when used at the wrist uh, for a range of gestures, uh, but can be improved significantly with pressure sensors, uh, and in particular for uh, wrist gestures. And uh, now that we know these results, we know that pressure sensor can, in fact, uh, facilitate for certain types of gestures, and it can be useful when used in conjunction. Uh, we think that this could, this could have you know, potential implications for future work. So, uh, for example, you could combine these, gest uh, these sensors now, so you could stack them on top of each other, and in this way, you, you have less surface area, which means there's more space for sensors. And uh, you may also be able to potentially uh, measure the pressure and, in fact, correct this modulation uh, from the EMG if, if it is useful. Uh, we didn't actually test the cross-session performance of our device, um, but there, there have been shown to be uh, shift compensating algorithms in the past, and this could quite easily be used for our uh, current work. Uh, but furthermore, because we have pressure data which senses the shape of the wrist, you could use this to infer the orientation of the device around your wrist uh, to help uh, get the kind of shift, the orientation shift. And lastly, but quite importantly, is that uh, I realize that uh, you know, wet electrodes probably aren't the most uh, ergonomic sensor type. Um, ideally, you'd want it to be dry, um, but dry electrode technology is improving, um, and uh, lately results have been shown that uh, the accuracy is, in fact, comparable to wet electrodes. Um, and conductive, dry conductive foams have also been uh, developed recently, um, and this could be a replacement for the, uh, the foam that is used around wet electrodes that were used in this experiment. Uh, thank you for listening to the talk. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, yeah. uh, Gerard Wilkinson from Open Lab, Newcastle University. Um, so did you, you said you didn't get cross-session drift. No. What about during the session? And also did you see, uh, see did you require a uh, placement of the sensors in very careful positions uh, before you started? Uh, no, actually. We, we kind of... So the positions uh, look like this. So you, you, they're pretty much the same for each person. And because, because the wrist is so small, in fact, um, there's not really much, much place for variation anyway. Um, yeah. Uh, what, sorry, what was the first part of the question? Uh, sorry. So during the session, did you have any drift yeah. in the sensors? Uh, no, no, we didn't. Hi, Dennis Pornhofer. Um The classifier, was it trained um, as a user-independent classifier, or did you um, design it like as a user-dependent classifier? It, it was dependent on the user. It would be trained uh, for a particular user, yeah. It was not a live classifier. In the end, you did it at, like post analysis of the data, right? Pardon? Was it a post analysis, or did it also um, had a life classification? Oh no, it was it was done post, but uh, the classification could run in real time. Um, we found that it, it could run in sort of a few milliseconds for the classification. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Right. Christoph Wama from Kinemic, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I have a question. You showed quite high accuracies for the finger uh, flexion uh, for solely EMG. Yeah. Did you see a difference for, let's say, thumb and pinky because those are the muscles that are located close to the wrist and for the other fingers, the muscles are located far away from the, from the wrist? So did you see a difference when you, when you looked at the results in detail? Um, actually, I... In the paper, there are um, there is a uh, confusion matrix, so you can see. I think um, yeah. So this is the confusion matrix for finger gestures, uh, which includes the thumb actually, um, and I think no, the, the thumb the thumb was actually okay. Um, 
they're, they're pretty much the same across the board. Okay, thanks. Right. Hello, I'm Hong Yuwen from Tsinghua University. So I'm wondering if the finger gestures are static or not. Or I mean, if you maintain the gestures when you test them or uh, they are inactive for the recognition. Um, so it seems from the, uh, the picture of the gestures, they are static, right? Uh, so you hold this. Yeah, so, so, it's, so we record for a duration of uh, about two and a half seconds. Okay, two and a um, half seconds. About two and a half seconds, and that's, that's for, like, flexion and extension. Oh, okay, so thank you. All right. Okay. One last question. Um, you said you used the tenfold cross-validation with other folds, um, and why didn't you maybe test the leave one out? Um, so, yeah, we, we did do a leave one out, one out test uh, tenfold cross-validation. So, so we trained it on nine of the subsets, and then we classified the last fold, and then we iterated ten times. Okay.